Ezekiel chapter 23, lesson number 17. So we pick up and what's happening is, uh, this is the last part of vision number three. And these elders, select elders, not all the elders who were in exile with Ezekiel, um, of the of the of the northern kingdom have come and sat down. Their they, their intent was to come and to tell the Lord some things or talk with the Lord about some things. And the Lord has nothing to do with it. He's not going to listen at all. He's not going to listen to them. In fact, he tells us at the beginning of this vision, "You've come to talk to me, but I'm going to do some talking to you." Now, I want to remind you, just as an application, there are many times in our lives, folks, when we think it's time for us to talk to God and we've got something we want to say or perhaps we want to cry out to God about something and we've got something that we think is very important to us and we go to talk to God, we feel like nothing goes through the ceiling, we feel like there's nothing being heard by God and the truth is, God told these elders, I am not going to listen to you because I have things for, to say to you. And that's exactly what happens in our lives sometimes. We have things we think we want to talk to God about, and God says, No, I'm not listening to what you want to say. I have some things to say to you. Now, for those of us who have been through the full 22 chapters already of the book of Ezekiel, it's becoming very clear to us that in the book of Ezekiel, what God is doing, the Lord is doing, is He's laying out the history of the nation of Israel that's going to lead right up to the final history of that that thousand-year kingdom and the temple He's going to live in uh, when He comes back. Uh, to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords over all the world. And Israel is going to be the nation of the world. Now, folks, Israel is the hated nation of the world right now. There are only a few countries that, that uh, even uh, uh, have a relationship with Israel at this point in time in the world. They're hated. I mean, just look at it. Jordan hates them just over the river. The Palestinians hate them. The Iraqis, Iranian, Afghanistan, you just name it. They, they're just hated by everybody. But the Bible tells us that's going to happen. It tells us that's going to happen. So at this last part of the vision, starting with the 39th assignment, in fact, every time the, the scripture says, and the word of the Lord came to me, I have listed that as an assignment. And so we're on the 39th assignment is where we are, or 30th, I'm sorry, assignment, uh, that is coming to, coming to Ezekiel where he's got a job to do. And the job is this. The job is he is supposed to tell the people, the, the elders, the elders of the northern kingdom who've been exiled for 119 years by now, he's supposed to tell them something. When it was the elders of Judah, where the southern kingdom still in place, he was to tell them some things. And so here we are, and he's, he's, the Lord says, I want you to talk to them. He says this. The word of the Lord came to me again saying, Son of man, there are two women, the daughters of a mother, one mother, and they played the harlot in Egypt, and they played the harlot in their youth, and there their breasts were pressed, and their virgin bosoms were handled. Now, folks, I have absolutely no idea why the Lord expects us as ministers to deal with this type of material right here. I mean, I told you that in chapter 16, I told you that in chapter 22, and here we are again. So I'm going to handle it as gently as I can. Here's the problem. Here's what a harlot is. A harlot's a prostitute. We all know what prostitutes are. We're not used to the word harlot. We don't use it very much. But there are two daughters, all both daughters of the same mother, who are acting like prostitutes. And they learn to do it down in Egypt. And here's just the summary of this. I've already told you because Ezekiel's already told us all the history. The Lord's told through Ezekiel the history. The history of after the Tower of Babel, uh, the, the son of uh, Ham comes to the land that we call Canaan land. His name is Canaan. And all of his descendants are going to become the, the Canaanite tribes. Uh, that's the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the, you know, the mo the whole, all, the, all the ites, okay? Not all of them, but most of them. And they, um, they were there and they settled the land and they built a town in an area where the capital city of Samaria is going to be purchased and he's going to build um, a, the capital there. He's going to move it to there. 
that city of Samaria becomes a, a village first, long before the hill of Mount Zion, which we call Jerusalem today, had people living on it. So some, the land where Samaria sits is the older sister, and the land where Jerusalem sits is the younger sister. But if we go back, uh, chapters back, we learned before that Samaria was the older sister. Jerusalem was actually the middle sister. And then after Jerusalem had been established, another town down on the uh, Jordan River Valley by the name of Sodom had been formed, and that was the, really the youngest sister. But the Lord's not chosen to talk, talk about Sodom here because Sodom's been destroyed. Samaria was the capital city until 119 years before this passage is written. But it's, it's still being inhabited by some people who are over there. In fact, in fact, the Assyrian Empire has, has moved in the poorest of the poor and also the prisoners down into this land that they've conquered, the Northern Empire, and they've moved these Sumeritans, S-U, not S-A, Sumeritans, because those people, the, the Assyrians were called the Sumer people, all right? Well, they've, they've moved the, the worst of the prisoners down there, and they've all intermarried. Well, by the time Jesus comes along, one of those women is a Samaritan woman. She's half Jewish and half Sumer, okay? And so she can't go down into Jerusalem because to worship because she's not full blood. And we know all know that story. So that's how that's what's happening. This those people have already moved in and they're already beginning to in, intermarry with the Jews who were left behind, those poorest of the poor. So here, uh, the Lord is talking about about uh, those people of Israel who have had two capitals. One in Jerusalem and one in Samaria, one of the northern kingdom, one of the southern kingdom. And the sins that they have done, they learned how to do those sins when they were in their youth down in Egypt. Now, if you remember also, down there in Egypt, uh, back when, when, when the Lord promised Abraham that his descendants would be uh, the nation of the nations, he also promised that they would be in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. Well, when you're in bondage in Egypt, that's not a blessing. That's actually a curse to you. They were, in, they were in bondage because of the sins that they had learned to do in Egypt for 400 years. Just as promised. They fulfilled the prophecy. Actually, they were down there 430 years. Uh, Joseph had been there a few years more than that. But after they finally get there, they spend 430 years there. And, and after 30 years, the king comes along who knows not Joseph, and they begin to, to force them to do labor and all of that. And then they cry out to the Lord. But what has happened is, is they have learned how to worship every false god that Egypt has. Every false god that Egypt has. Well, the Lord's not happy with that. So when he took them out of Egypt, it was his intent to get them out of Egypt and to get Egypt out of them. Okay, you understand that for them to leave everything behind, but they don't leave everything behind at all. They 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 hang on to everything. And so the Lord is making this metaphor analogy that Samaria and the capital of the northern kingdom and Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom, have been like two daughters uh, two daughters of the same mother back when Saul was the king and the capital was, uh, in fact, Saul, King Saul never had the capital in Jerusalem. That doesn't happen until seven years after David becomes king. David's got his capital in Hebron. He takes the Jebusite citadel. He moves everybody there. He makes it his, he makes it his, um, his capital and he calls it Jerusalem. Well, Samaria is already a town still up there, uh, up in the north. But so we've got these two daughters, so we've got a, a capital for the northern kingdom, a capital for the southern kingdom, and they once were all together in one nation. So that's the two daughters of one mother is what that is saying. But while they were down in Egypt, they learned to just do all the, the most detestable and horrible things against the Lord uh, as they could. And of course, they don't have any rules and regulations because the Lord's not given them any of that yet. 
And so when he finally gets them out of Egypt and he gets them to Mount Sinai, he gives them the rules and the regulations of you shall not do this and you shall not do this and thou shalt not have any other gods before me. And that's, that's the main one. That's the big one. I mean, yeah, there's ten, but the one that really, really, really is upsetting to him is they had other gods besides him in Egypt, and he, he wants those gods out of there. And they're no gods at all. They're phantom gods. But there's where they learn to get close to those gods. Now listen, from a human st standpoint, there is absolutely nothing wrong in a proper marriage relationship for a man to see the breast of his wife or even to touch the breast of his wife or the wife to press her breast against her husband. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's all perfect. That's all in God's plan. It's only wrong in ungodly relationships. And what the Lord is accusing the northern kingdom of Israel and Samaria of doing, and now the southern kingdom is entering into ungodly relationships. In fact, you're going to see this over and over again. I'm going to tell you right now so that I don't have to hit it very often, even though we'll hear it quite often as we go through. The problem is, is when the, when the Israelites had a need, they didn't trust God. They did not trust God to answer those needs. Rather, instead of going and asking the Lord to provide the provision, they went to a country nearby to get the provision. And it was the provision they could scrounge up. Israel was not willing to allow God to work it out, and they thought they had to have other helpers. The two names of these girls, the names of the girls were the Ohala, the elder, and Olahalaba, the sister. And he says, they became mine. In other words, they were his. Remember, Israel belongs to the Lord. And they bore sons and they bore... I mean, they had people in them is what it's talking about. And as far as their names, Samaria is Ohola and Jerusalem is Holabah. So you just keep reading. The Bible interprets itself. Isn't that a wonderful thing? By the way, it works everywhere. Whatever question you have. When somebody holds up a verse and says, God says this right there. See that verse. And you need to know what that verse means. Just back up and read the whole passage. And it will explain itself to you. I promise you. It's not difficult. So we know the names of these two daughters. All right. It goes on. This says, Ahola played the harlot while she was mine. Now that's the northern kingdom. That's Samaria. By the way, look at the board. The word Ahola means she has a tent. The word Aholaba means my tent is in her. The Lord has given these names on purpose for a special reason. Samaria, when they broke off after the death of Solomon, and the northern kingdom took Samaria to be the capital, they built a temple there that is, was not there by the time that the, the Samaritan woman met Jesus. That temple had been destroyed. But during this time, in Ezekiel's life, in this passage, we're, we're a long ways from that Samaritan woman, and that temple is still there. There was a place of worship in Samaria, but if you remember Jeroboam I, who became the first king of the northern kingdom after Solomon's death, Jeroboam changed the dates. You didn't do the festivals on the same dates, because he was afraid that if you worshipped in the north at the same time as you worshipped in the south, then some... Uh, Sometime in the future under his reign, those people in the north would just stop, start worshiping with the south, and then the two kingdoms would be at odds again, trying to join back together. Following? So Jeroboam didn't want that. Well, there's a temple, there's a tent down in the southern kingdom. That's the temple that Solomon built. And the Lord says, That's my temple, that's where I am. There's one up north, it's a false temple. But the one down here in Ahulabath, this is my temple. That's not going to work out well for Jerusalem because the problem is the sins in the temple to the north in Samaria were bad enough. But when you brought those same sins into the temple in Jerusalem, that doubled the problem. So Ahola played the harlot while she was mine, and she lusted after her lovers, after the Assyrians, her neighbors, who were clothed in purple and governors and officials and all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding on horses, and she bestowed her harlotries on them, all of them, all of whom were the choicest men of Assyria, 
and, all, and with all of whom she had lusted after, with all their idols, she defiled herself. The Lord is actually speaking about a specific case that happened. And it happens in 2 Kings. The story is told in 2 Kings. Now, I'm not going to read that passage to you. I'm going to skip through it and tell it to you really quick. <clears throat> Samaria is trying to attack Jerusalem. So Samaria goes up to Damascus and gets a king by the name of Rezin, who's the king of Aram. That's also Syria. Not Assyria, but Syria. The king down here is Samaria. And the king of Aram join forces together, and they come to attack Jerusalem. Well, Ahaz, the king of the southern kingdom, reaches out to a friend, she hopes a friend, way over here in Nineveh, whose name is tiglath Pilazar. We also see his name in the scripture called Pul. That was his nickname, Pul. And he says, Ahaz says, hey, Pul, or Tiglath, if you will, Come help me. So Tiglath comes over. He kills Rezin. He beats back um, the king of the northern kingdom. And he helps the southern kingdom. Well, Ahaz is going to thank Tiglath Pilazar. And he meets them in Damascus. Meets the king of Assyria. He's the Syrian empire. He's, the Syrian empire is conquering, going to conquer the northern empire. Not going to get the southern. So the southern king goes and meets him to say thank you. And there in Damascus, according to the passage here in Jeremiah, I mean in Kings, Ahaz sees this incredibly gorgeous altar to a false god. So he, the scripture tells us he designs it out, he draws it out, he sends it back to his priest and tells his priest to build this for him. And by the time Ahaz gets back to Jerusalem, the altar is built and put on a high place and Ahaz begins worshiping that false god. It makes the Lord really mad. Really, really mad. So we skip through those passages there. Second Kings, it tells us that story. And that's what's going on. This, this king has lusted after uh, help from the Assyrian Empire. In other words... Instead of going to Jehovah God and asking for help, he went to a neighbor. And oh, by the way, once he met the neighbor, he also met his God, his false God, his phantom God, and decided to start worshiping that phantom God. Well, it goes on, verse 8 says, She did not forsake her harlotries from her time in Egypt. She learned to worship false gods in Egypt. Learn to first worship first false gods in the promised land. For in her youth men had lain with her and had handled her virgin bosoms and poured out their lust on her. She worshipped all sorts of terrible lives. Remember, this is an analogy. This is a metaphor. These are not women he's talking about. He's talking about the nation of Israel. She had done all sorts of disgusting, evil things against the Lord's desires while she was in Egypt, and now she's continuing to do it. And so what happens? He says, Therefore I gave her into the hands of the lovers, into the hands of the Assyrians, after whom she lusted. And they uncovered her nakedness, and they took her sons and her daughters, and they slew her with the sword, and thus she became a byword among women, and they ex executed judgment on her. In other words, finally, because of how terrible and how sinful they were, uh, the Lord just allowed Assyria, whose capital was Nineveh, to come in and take the northern kingdom out and just take them out. And that happened 119 years prior to this, this story in the passage. So the Lord's saying, Ahola got taken into exile because of what she had done and the way she had cozied up in a relationship to the false gods and idols of those countries. Well, we come to Aholabah now. The other sister, the younger sister, Jerusalem. It says, now her sister Aholabah saw this. Yet she was more corrupt in her lust than she. And her harlotries were more than the harlotries of her sister. She lusted after the Assyrians, governors and the officials, the ones near, 
magnificently dressed, horsemen riding on horses, all of the desirable young men. I saw that she had defiled herself, and they both took the same way. Now, I could, on the passage before and on the passage here, talked about all this language about the governors and the magnificently dressed and how they would have been dressed and the horses and all that. I could have done that. I decided not to do that because the point of this passage is this. Samaria was a bad town and a bad group of people who worshipped idols in a bad way. However, because of Jerusalem's relationship, they followed, people of Jerusalem followed and did the same things that those people in Samaria did. And the thing that made it bad is, is they did it right in the temple, in the temple complex in Jerusalem, belonged to the Lord, had been dedicated to Him. In other words, they both did the same way as the scripture says. So what is, happens here? They thirsted. It says this. So she increased her harlotries. She kept doing these idols. And she saw men portrayed on the walls and images of the Chaldeans portrayed in, with vermilion, girded with belts on their loins, with the flowing turbans on their heads, all of them looking like officers, like the Babylonians in Chaldea, the land of their birth. And when she saw them, she lusted after them, and she sent messengers to them in Chaldea. Now, the interesting is because the language has changed here. It's talking about the Chaldeans and the Babylonians. Well, the Chaldeans were Babylonians. But we've already seen in a previous chapter that whenever he's, the Lord is talking about the Chaldeans, he's talking about the merchants of Babylon or the merchants of Chaldea. Everybody wants to take part and buy merchandise from Babylon, from these merchants of Chaldea. Now you have to remember, Daniel's in charge of this empire. This is the Babylonian empire now, and Daniel's in charge of it. And the Babylonian empire, even though it is being led by the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst, all kings, everybody thought that Nebuchadnezzar was the most evilest man on the world, and he is or he was, until he finally has an encounter with God. But he was smart enough, or the Lord, to recognize that the Lord had put somebody special in his, in his sight, and his name was Daniel, and he put Daniel in charge of all the kingdom. So all this stuff going on, all this stuff going on in, with Babylon and Jerusalem, they're, they're rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar, but they're also rebelling against Daniel. And what's Daniel doing? Daniel's just laying out for them what God wants to happen to, the, to Jerusalem and the, and the southern kingdom. He's following God's will. Nebuchadnezzar is doing the war, and he's coming in. Well, every country wants to do business with the wealthiest country in the world, which is Babylon. I mean, if you can buy goods from them and sell them and all that, you want to take part. You want to take part. Now, I got news for you folks. Every country in the world, if they will be honest with you, they want to take part with America. They really do. Now, they don't want us to know that. They don't want us to know that. But they really, is there a country in the world that has been blessed as much as America? Is there a country? I don't think there is. You have to remember the poorest of the poor that we have out underneath, living underneath the bridges, are wealthier than the people in a lot of countries. A lot of countries. Just simply because of the overflow that is here in America. And as you know, we've got people who are trying to come here to America. And I, I do not understand why they're running from their own countries and yet, when they get here, they want to bring their country with them. Well, if they wanted to get out of their country, why don't they leave their country behind? The Lord even says, here to Egypt, I'm taking you out of Egypt. Leave Egypt behind. He was getting them out of Egypt. Get Egypt out of you. Egypt had not gone out. Well, here, right here, Southern Kingdom is thinking, hey, Nebuchadnezzar's got this great thing going. And by the way, we got one of our own who's over there really running things. We need to do trade with them. They want to do trade with these Chaldeans. Trade with these that were dressed in this red vermilion and all of that. With all this stuff. They, the southern kingdom wanted what the, the Babylonian empire had. The Lord's disgusted with the Babylonian lovers. 
It says the Babylonians came to her to the bed of, the lo of love and defiled her with her harlotry. And when she had been defiled by them, she became disgusted with them. And she uncovered her harlotries and uncovered her nakedness. And then the, I became disgusted with her, the Lord says, and I had become disgusted with her sister. In other words, they started doing business with the Babylonian Empire. They started doing business with the Assyrian Empire. They did business with the Egyptian Empire. All trying to do things when all they had to do was just let go and let God be God in their life. But no, they had to go. And what happens is it's just like with Ahaz. When he went up to meet the king, tiglath Pilazar to meet him, he sees this idol. And when he sees this idol, he wants this idol. This idol is forbidden, and yet he wants it. So he has one made. My dad used to say, if you don't intend to buy, don't go shopping. And it's a truth. You need absolutely nothing, but you want to go to the mall. Before you got to the mall and before you, before you started going through the stores, you, you didn't know you needed stuff that you were looking at that you finally figured out that you needed. <laughs> and money started burning a hole in your pocket because you needed it. But an hour before, you didn't even know you needed it. What sense does that make? That's what's going on here. The southern kingdom, just as the northern kingdom, didn't even know what they needed, but when they went and saw it, they had to have it. Had to have it. Had to have it. By the way, folks, I'm in the giving away and getting rid of stage of my life. When I go to a party that's giving door prizes and they give you a ticket, I give the ticket back. I don't want to take anything home anymore at all. I don't need anything anymore besides groceries. Now, if you want to take me out to eat, that's a different thing, okay? I don't need all this stuff. I don't need to go looking at it. And the Lord's disgusting with him because she's entered this relationship with the Babylonians. He says, yet she multiplied her harlotries, remembering the days of her youth when she played the harlot in the land of Egypt and she lusted after their paramour. That means, uh, okay, a mistress is the lover of a man. A paramour is the lover of a woman. Got that, okay? It's partners. Who, whose flesh is like the flesh of donkey and whose issue is like the issue of horses. God, why did you put that in there? What in the world? In other words, he's saying, you have lusted so much for them that they are, they are overpowering you. Thus you long for the lewdness of your youth when the Egyptians handled your bosom because of the breast of your youth. You're longing for what you used to have before you had rules, in other words. You're, you, they're sinning and they know they're sinning and they're longing for that. And guess what? There are just some people out there and some folks that whenever the rules don't matter to them, folks. They know the rules. They know they're going to feel guilty when they get through, but they're going to enjoy it until they feel guilty. And every one of us in here have done that before. Every one of us have done that. We do what we should not do knowing that we're going to feel guilty, but we do it anyway because we just want to. I had a person in my office this week tell me what she'd done, and I said, don't you know that's a sin? She says, I know it's a sin, but I did it because I wanted to. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm wondering if God has any dispensation for those who do it on purpose. No, I think it's worse, right? Well... Actually, the Lord even talks about what's going on here because in Jeremiah chapter 44, and let me tell you what this story is. The northern Nebuchadnezzar is coming hard on the, northern, on the southern kingdom. And so the king, Zedekiah, says, okay, I'm going to go down to, to the Pharaoh of Egypt and I'm going to ask him for some help. And his name is King Hopher. In fact, King Hopher's name is actually mentioned here in this passage. Uh, there it is, if you'll see there on verse 30, who we're talking about there. So we know exactly who we're talking about. It's King Hopher. What 
when Zedekiah, as the king of the southern kingdom, begins reaching out for King Hopeford to help, King Hopeford, Zedekiah doesn't realize that Nebuchadnezzar has already conquered the Egyptian empire. And King Pharaoh Hophra is no longer in control. Nebuchadnezzar's in control. And Nebuchadnezzar has allowed King Hopeford to stay there and to rule under him as one of those vassals, one of those prefects. And he, 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 King Hopeford's reporting right back to Daniel's, who he's going to report to. And Zedekiah reaches out to Hopeford, and Hopeford cannot help because now he too belongs to Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, the Lord has told Nebuchadnezzar that every place that he takes, every person, every animal, every plot of land, and every piece of vegetation belongs to Nebuchadnezzar when he takes it. And every bit of Egypt belongs to him. And so the southern kingdom's reaching out to Egypt, out to one of her (coughs) ex-lovers, to see if that relationship can be kindled. And the place that she should be reaching out to is God. But she just won't. She just won't. Verse 22 says this, Therefore, O Halaba, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will arouse your lovers against you and from from whom you were alienated, and I will bring them against you from every side, the Babylonians and the Chaldeans and Peacock and Shoa and Koa and the Assyrians with them. Desirable young men, Uh, governors and officials, all of them, officials and men of renown, all of them riding on horses. And they will come against you with weapons, chariots and wagons, and with a company of people. The word company there means assembly. And they will set themselves against you on every side with buckler and with shield and with helmet. And I will commit the judgment to them, and they will judge you according to their customs. Oh my, who is this? The Lord is telling Jerusalem and the southern kingdom that he's going to bring, he is, the Lord is going to bring Nebuchadnezzar along with all the countries she's had to try to have a relationship with. She's had to try with, she's tried it with Egypt. She's tried it with Syria or Aram. She's tried it with the Assyrian Empire. And way over here in Iran, she's tried it with three groups of folks, Peacock, Shoa, and Koa. These are three tribal areas who we know from the history joined in because they're all part of the Babylonian Empire. You remember, this is where, when we say Iran, that's the Persians, okay? Uh, Cyrus the Great, uh, his people are under Nebuchadnezzar's tro- control until they rise up and take over Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And it's the Medes and the Persians. They're right here. These folks are Persians. And they are going to come. And they're going to join in this battle. They're going to come as a large assembly, as a large company. And they're going to come with their swords and their weapons and their battering rams and everything. And they're going to destroy the southern kingdom. Because of what? Because of her sin against the Lord for idolatry. Idolatry. And which we're going to find out in just a minute. Their sin against the Lord for profaning the Sabbath. And as we're going to find out, the sin against the Lord of profaning his tent, the temple. And they're doing it through the act of idolatry. It's terrible. There's going to be injury to, by these lovers. These people who are coming, Peacock, Koa, and all that, Assyria, Babylon, Damascus, uh, Egypt, Lud, Put, they all belong to Nebuchadnezzar. He says, I will set my jealousy against you that they may deal with you in wrath. They will remove your nose and your ears and your survivors will fall by the sword and they will take your sons and your daughters and your survivors <clears throat> will be consumed by the fire and they will also strip you of your clothes and take away your beautiful jewels. Cut your nose and cut your ears. Indians in America took scalps, but in those days... They took noses and ears. In fact, it's not going to be only them. 
in the days later on when the Vikings go and come and they would impose a tax on all the people down through the coast. They would say to the people, we are going to be back here in a month on our way back. <clears throat> and when we come, you will owe us this amount of money. And when they come back and they don't have the money, they would take their knives and they would slice the nostril on one side. It showed that they had not paid the tax. The next time the Vikings came through, if they did not have the money, they would cut the other side of the nose. And on the third time, they would cut the nose off. Thus, we end up with the phrase, you are paying through the nose. That's where that came from. After the nose came the ears. Folks, you don't realize, if you don't have these ears out here, you can't hear. I mean, the eardrum may be working, but if you don't have, some, if you don't have a catcher, you got to have it. Then they took the ears. That's just what the people did. That's what they did. Terrible. The Lord says, they're going to come. And these ruthless people are not going to change their ways. They're going to take your noses. They're going to take your ears. They're going to take your sons. And they're going to take your daughters. And they're going to carry them off. They're going to do all of this. And listen, they're going to burn you with the fire. They're going to burn you. After they take your nose and ears, they're going to burn you. They're going to take away everything that's precious to you. They're going to come. And these are the people that you've had a relationship with. Thus I will make your lewdness, that means uh, your evil uh, deeds, uh, evil plans, and your harlotry brought from the land of Egypt to cease from you, so that you will not lift up your eyes to them or remember Egypt anymore. In other words, he's saying the only way for me to get Egypt out of you is death. Is death. So that those who are sons and daughters who never knew Egypt and never knew what you knew will not know about it any longer. Well, for thus says the Lord God to Aholabah, Jerusalem, Behold, I will give you into the hands of those whom you hate, into the hands of those whom you were, whom you were alienated. In other words, you were lovers with them, you love their idols, you love their deeds, but then mm, they did away with you. They were not interested in you. In fact, he says this, they will deal with you in hatred, take your property, they will leave you naked and bare, that means with nothing, and nakedness of your harlotries will be removed both from your lewdness and from your heart. They're going to be stripped, in other words. They're going to strip everything away from this near and dear to them in that city of Jerusalem. And we know that happened. These things will be done to you because you have played the harlot with the nations, because you have defiled yourself with their idols. That's the whole ball of wax right there. Who, what God are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the God who loves you and takes care of you? Or are you going to serve some phantom God that you carved up? It says, You have walked in the way of your sister, therefore I will give her cup into your hand. 119 years before Samaria faced this same deal, they were destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. And now the southern uh, capital, Jerusalem, is going to be destroyed just like her sister was destroyed up north. Thus says the Lord God, you will drink your sister's cup. In other words, everything that she got, you're fixing to get which is deep and which is wide, and you will be laughed at and be held in derision. It contains much. This cup that you're about to get is fixing to destroy your relationships around the world that you have. Go put you in place. Well, I could stop right here and we could go back to Ezekiel 5. We could go back to Ezekiel 16. And we could go to Ezekiel 22nd. I mean, it's 22. Um, and in all those passages, the Lord has already said this over and over, at least three times, and maybe really alluded to it more times than that, but point blank in those three passages that I'm not going to read for you because of our time, the Lord has said, this is going to happen to you. You are fixing to face wrath like you've never seen before. It says this, you will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow. The cup of horror and desolation. The cup of your sister Samaria. You will drink it and drain it. Then you will gnaw its fragments and tear your breast. 
For I have spoken, declares the Lord God. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, bears now the punishment of your lewdness and your harlotries. Because of the things you have done, you have forgotten God. Forgotten God in many, many, many ways. You've turned your back on God. God said, I'll be your Lord, I'll be your God, I'll take you, I'll uphold you, I will, I will take you through times of trouble. But no, you're running off on doing your own things, and because of that, you're going to pay the punishment for that. Moreover, the Lord said to me, Son of man, now that's his name that he calls Ezekiel. He says, Son of man, will you judge Ahola and Aholabah? Will you, will you render the judgment for this? Will you need to say this to them? You need to say, then declare to them their abominations. Tell them, Ezekiel, what I am telling you they have done wrong. Tell it to them. And by the way, because I'm telling you to tell it to them, let me just remind you of what those things are. They're adultery. For they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hand, and they have committed adultery with their idols, and even caused their sons, whom they bore to me, to pass through the fires to them as food. In other words, they have taken the firstborn male that was supposed to be dedicated to the Lord, dedicated him in that temple, and then took him and offered that baby to an idol to be burned in its belly or to be sacrificed as a human sacrifice. That is a profanity to the Lord God. And the Lord God is angered by that because of that adulterous relationship that they've entered into. They've defiled the Sabbath. He says, again, they have done this to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and have profaned my Sabbaths. For they had slaughtered their children for idols. They entered my sanctuary on the same day to profane it. And lo, they did, uh, thus they did within my house. Catch what he's saying here. They're dedicating a baby at the house of the Lord. Then they're offering it to another God. And then they're coming back to thank the Lord for what for being able to offer their sacrifice to another God. Not only that, they've done on the Sabbath what was illegal to do on the Sabbath. They should have been resting. And rather they were working hard at being against God. <clears throat> In your notes on page 169, what I'm going to read to you is sad. But in all these years of ministry since January the 20th of 1974, I have heard this testimony way too many times from, a, from wives who's, who have unfaithful husbands who are playing the game of being godly. It says on page 169, it's, it's the note on Ezekiel 2338. It says, in addition, the two sisters were guilty of defiling the Lord's temple with idol worship within and without its walls. Solomon started that with the gods of his many wives. Here we see the Lord recording for us uh, that the people worshipped idols and then defiled the Sabbath and the temple on the same day. And here's the example. It would be like a man who left the house early on Sunday morning to tell his wife that he had to get to church to help set up the chairs. But on the way, he stopped by his mistress's house on the way for a sexual encounter. And then after it was over, he continued on to the house of worship to set up the chairs and proudly put on or donned a choir robe and took his place in the dead center of the back row in the choir loft, only to stand there with a smile on his face as if everything was all right for the day. That's the classic profanity of the Lord's house today. Sin before you come as a sinner to the house and you don the choir robe and sit in front of everybody to be seen by everybody as if nothing has happened. Not only that, they've done something that the Lord says, you shall not do this and if you do it, the death penalty comes to you. It says, furthermore, they have even sent for men who come from afar to whom a messenger was sent and lo, they came. And whom you have bathed, 
painted your eyes, decorated your cells with ornaments, and you sat <clears throat> on a splendid couch, that's a bed, <clears throat> with a table arranged before it on which you had my incense and my oil. If you remember when they were at the foot of Mount Sinai, the Lord gave them the instruction of how to make the incense for the temple. That incense recipe was not to be used for any incense for anything anywhere else used in the world. And if it was ever used for anything else, death was the penalty. And the oil that was made for the perfumes and all that to be used in the temple was only the recipe to be used for in the temple. And yet, the nation of the southern kingdom of Israel, of Judah, I should say, and the capital of Jerusalem has taken that out from the Holy of Holies and they've brought it into the natural and the common. And they've used it to lure in these lovers and they've painted up their lips and they've painted their eyebrows and they've combed their hair and they've bathed and they've moisturized and they've done all this. That's all just a metaphor for what the city's done. They've laid out the red carpet and they're opening all their doors to all the sinners around the terrible countries who worship idols and God is upset with them because they were not supposed to use that incense for that purpose. They're not supposed to use the oil for that purpose. The sound of careless, this multitude was with her, and drunkards were brought from the wilderness with men of the common sort. And they put bracelets on the hands of the women and beautified crowns on their heads. The carefree multitude back here, the Lord's going to say this. He says it over. He says, you know, things are wrong. Things are wrong. Things are wrong. You've committed all these unterrible things. He says, then I was considering her who was worn out by uh, adulteries. When they had committed adultery with her, when she is thus. In other words, he's saying, she has gone about as far as a prostitute as she can go, and she needs to be worn out, and she is worn out, and this is fiction to be over. But they went into her as they would go into a harlot, and thus they went into Ahola and to Aholaba, the lewd women. In other words, those who had had a relationship with these prostitutes or these harlots went in to do damage to them. And here's the damage. He says, but they, righteous men, will judge them with the judgment of adulteresses. Somewhere along the way, they had gotten into the right groove, and now they're going back to pay the penalty. And the Lord is sending them back because they're righteous, because the Lord is sending them to do a deed. You can be an evil person, but doing a righteous deed for God. Isn't that an interesting concept? Isn't that? Surely, O oh Lord, you're not sending Nebuchadnezzar, Habakkuk said. You're not sending Nebuchadnezzar. Your eyes are too pure to look upon sin. You're not sending them. He gets through with the prayer, and the Lord says, Well, Nebuch where, well Habakkuk. Yeah, you need to understand I am sending them. But they're so ungodly. I know, but they're doing a righteous deed for me, for me. And with the judgment of women who shed blood. In other words, he's going back to, 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 to harm and to bring wrath upon because of the blood that they've shed of their children. They're also being cannibals at this point in time, which is against God's law. Because they are adulteresses and blood is on their hands. The two sisters are exactly alike. In other words, for thus says the Lord God, bring up a company that's an assembly against them and give them over to terror and plunder. In other words, march it right up to their door and make them have fear in their lives. Right there, fear. A company an assembly will stone them with stones and cut them down with swords and they will slay their sons and their daughters and burn their houses with fire. Jerusalem is going to burn to the ground. In fact, the heat from the burning of the cedar trees will be so hot that the gold on the temple will begin to melt before the, the fire actually has arrived inside the city. And when the fire comes up from the south, Nebuchadnezzar and his men will have battered the ram, used their battering rams, and come through the northern gate, and their people will all gather in the middle with a fire on one side of them, and the swords and the clubs and the stones on the other side of them, and they are going to be destroyed right there. 
everyone who is in the city of Jerusalem that does not walk through that gate and go join Nebuchadnezzar out in the field is going to die inside the city. It is the melting pot that will destroy that will they will be destroyed. Thus I will make lewdness, that means your evil plans, cease from the land that all women may be um, admonished and not commit lewdness as you have done. And all of God's people and all of God's leadership will be in right step with him one day. Your lewdness will be requited upon you and you will bear the penalty of worshiping your idols. Thus you will know that I am the Lord God. You elders of Israel who decided to come talk to me, you need to think about what you were coming to talk to me about because I have told you what I'm thinking. And your capital city of Jerusalem is about to fall just as the capital of the Samaria of the northern kingdom fell. They're all going to drink the same cup. In fact... The Lord is going to take away the promised land from them, but he promises that it will be returned one day to them. Some of us are old enough to remember. I am not. I was not here yet. But in 1948, when Israel got the promised land back, the Lord promised that. And he always keeps his promise. In fact, the Lord to Jeremiah, Jeremiah is over in chapter 31 of Jeremiah, is going to say to the Lord, Lord, is this destruction, the same destruction we're talking about, is this destruction going to destroy Israel so no one can survive? And the Lord says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, if you can count the stars, if you can count the grains of sand on the seashore, if you can measure the size of the heavens, or if you could put the foundation of this earth in place, if you or anyone can do that, yes, Israel can be destroyed. But none of y'all can do that. Therefore, Israel will never be annihilated. Lord's got a promise with Israel, and he's going to keep his promise. Iran may want to destroy it. Persia may want to, I mean, Pakistan may want to destroy it. Afghanistan may want to destroy it. Jordan may want to destroy it. Russia may want to destroy it. The Ahabs, the Arabs, the sheiks of the burning sand down in Saudi Arabia may want to destroy it. The Egyptians may want to destroy it. The Palestinians may want to destroy it. The Turkish may want to destroy it. But you know what? They can try all they want. It will not be destroyed. Israel will last. Israel will last. And when the Lord, it's time for the Lord to come back. And in the middle of the tribulation, the Lord allows Israel to see him and acknowledge the miracles that he's done there. Two-thirds of the nation of Israel will not do that, by the way. But the right people will. And one-third of the nation of Israel will survive. And will make it into the thousand-year kingdom when the Lord comes to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And we're going to learn about that temple when we get to the end of Ezekiel. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time, for your love, for your care. Even for these words that I wish were not here. But Lord, they have a meaning. And we understand that meaning of how bad it was and how bad Israel had gotten against you. They're not really much better today, even though they're not worshiping idols. But the problem is that they've not recognized you. And Lord, we pray for that day. And we know that you've promised that day will come. And we look forward to that day. In your name, amen and amen.